the idea that a certain image, a certain video might be too graphic. But we forget about something extremely fundamental about all of this. Whether you like this video or not, is secondary. Whether this video is good or not, is also not the point. The point is that every effort that I put in this was really at my leisure, you know? I was comfortable in my own house. I got to choose the music. I got to choose the segments. I put it together. The whole hope is that if there is an individual here in this room that does not know anything about this, maybe he'll get curious or she'll get motivated. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that the most important part about the video are the images. The images that were only made possible by individuals, by Syrians, that had no luxury of media covering them and their lives on the ground. Every single image that you see right here, it's been shot by a Syrian citizen, literally risking his life, trying to cover another Syrian individual in the process of losing his life, or that has already lost his life. And then he tries to do so without really caring about his life. He thinks that if I can just make this picture, if I can just shoot this video, and somehow if I can actually deliver it. Now believe it or not, there are probably hundreds of thousands of images that could not make it because they were either confiscated or destroyed. And then we end up with only a few images, maybe a few hundred of images that reach us. And what do we do with them at the end of the day? We decide if it's too graphic or not. We think, well, you know what, maybe this is not suitable for the audience. I guess our emotions are so delicate to the point that we cannot actually look at an image of a child that's getting beaten up. And we've not even displayed any of the disgusting images. Now we can actually pause it, we can stop it, we can think to ourselves that we're short on time, maybe so-and-so is not able to handle it, maybe we'll read this segment later on, maybe we'll watch this video later on. But Syrian citizens don't have this luxury. Every single day they live in terror. Every single night when the security agencies and the forces come knocking on their door or they come marching in their streets, cussing at them, dehumanizing them, killing them, they cannot tell them to come back in six hours or maybe in 12 hours. Maybe they can uh, stock up their supplies of food or maybe they can find a place to seek for refuge. In fact, even if they like, try to run away to Lebanon, the Lebanese government hand them back right to the very vicious regime they tried to escape from. So what I'm trying to say here is that we literally insult their efforts in trying to expose their very difficult reality. And we can, as much as possible, we can try to connect with them, but our minds shut off. We usually try to avoid pain at any cost. This is the way humans function. But we have to understand that we cannot see suffering when we are behind the wall. We cannot see suffering if we cannot hear the voices. So sometimes, yes, it is necessary to scream. It is necessary to actually re-emphasize that scream. And it is necessary to put it in the faces of everybody else. And to do that, one person cannot do it. Two people cannot do it. We're talking about uh, millions of Syrians that are suffering at the hands of a very well-organized mafia. Uh, a regime that has disconnected and divorced itself from humanity at all costs. The whole reason, the only reason they do that is because they want to stay in power. I mean, this is a true definition of mafia, a true definition of criminal organization. And what we have is that we've seen children, just a few children from Ba'a, by writing some simple writing on the walls, they were able to shake the foundations of this regime, literally. And then one individual, one Syrian individual, um, actually a relative of mine, said, they did all of this because we simply said we want freedom. What are they going to do when we ask for justice? So, I am trying to remind you guys not to bow down to their vicious attacks when it comes down to calling you certain names, labeling you in certain manners, calling you fundamentalist, calling you maybe a traitor, or calling you, or trying to pass on this propaganda that is Muslim fundamentalist. Well, I come from a Christian family, and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm an atheist. You know, typically speaking, that's not something I want to boast about. But I find it very appropriate to mention in the sea of insults, on attacks, on lies. You know, I have met these very wonderful gentlemen here. I've spoken to 
to Hussain I've spoken to Ammar, Ammar actually is the one who found me online. He didn't even care what my background was. All that mattered is that we both are looking for the same aim. All of us want a civil society, we want a society where people's rights are respected, but the people of Syria, no matter what they do, and they've done a hell of a lot, I mean literally they've set up a new standard of courage in Syria. They have risked their lives, and they have risked their lives of their beloved ones, which is a far larger risk than risking their own lives, to make sure that the, the fight continues on. And as you've seen, all they say, we want it to be peaceful, we want it to be civil. And I've had people speak to me from Syria, they tell us, what are you guys waiting for? We need your help. I mean, we are doing everything we can. What you want us to pick up arms, we're not going to do that. We're willing to get slaughtered until the last one of us. But we're not going to turn our country into a stage for civil war. And indeed, you know, I applaud them for this kind of courage. I applaud them for this kind of mental clarity. But they can't do anything unless we do our job. I mean, we've left our countries for two main reasons. Either seeking wealth or seeking freedom. I mean, it's one of these two. There's nothing else, right? What good are we if we cannot even use any of these? If we can't use our money, or if we cannot use our freedom. Now, some of us don't know how to speak well. Some of us don't know how to persuade other people well. Some of us don't have the money. But whatever it means that you have, whatever background you come from, doesn't matter. In fact, especially if you are from a Syrian minority. And in this aspect, I direct this to mostly to Christian Syrians that make up 74%. This is the official number. 74% of all Syrian Americans. And yet, I mean, I sadly say, I still have not seen them with the large numbers that they exist. And this is very important because I understand there are some concerns and fears, but I want you guys to know that, and I've met so many Christian Syrians so far, and I've been very thrilled that they have not succumbed to this kind of propaganda. But we need to speak up. We need to reach out to the communities. We need to start visiting churches. We need to start visiting mosques. We need to start feeling less shy and less embarrassed about talking about this. The regime certainly doesn't feel shy when they spread these lies about us. I mean, we just pressured Washington, you see, to make sure that they do not actually even think about war or think about economic sanctions. Yet, they say that we did so. So we need to step up. We need to make sure we use whatever we can. And I hope after this evening you guys um, you know, find a way in your own way. Thank you so much.